I'm Dave Blair. I'm with Old Conway Village. And if you've been here before, in the last couple of years, you've probably seen me in this very shop, building stuff. Then we had the pandemic. And I have an old saying, the life hands you the lemons, right by the name. And that's what we're going to do today. Because normally in this shop, I'm showing you we're working with my own tools, which are rather authentic, but they're not completely authentic. But they work, and I'm allowed to use them. The problem is, I'm not allowed to use the real tools because we don't want to break them any more than they are, because a lot of them are 200 years old. So, today, we've got a special treat. We're going to go into the shop, and we're going to look at them. And we're going to see what they do, what they're for, I'm going to use them, but we're going to show you what they're for. Follow me. This is usually what you see when you come over the economy. You see through the doorway, and I say to you, Oh, this is where the real tools are. And everybody says, Oh, that's nice, but they don't really get to see them. So I'm going to open the gate. We're going to go inside. Welcome to the real shop. Well, I have to confess, I'm like a kid in a candy store right now. I see all these tools around and I'm like, wow, what's this do? What's that do? This is like, the, the, and what I want to do is show you. And uh, I think we can do this. And uh, actually, woodworking or building anything for that matter can be split up into various aspects and what I want to do right now is talk about how they got how they measured things and uh, so we'll do that but before we do that I need to get my gloves on because we are taking care of the stuff like I said this is the stuff that nobody uses and uh, because we want to take care of it but we can show you how they work. Okay, so here we go. Uh, the most obvious thing about measurement is measuring in a straight line. And <clears throat> they had rulers for that, just like we do now. Inches, uh, just like we do now. This is a folding rule that I'm afraid to open. Uh, it's in pretty good shape. You can pretty well read it pretty easily. Um, there's another ruler here and this one is really neat um, the, what the cabinet maker would have done with one of these they'd probably put it in their pocket and they probably get it out 200 times in a day and it folds out like this locks like that and uh, the numbers are here you got the numbers on there it's hard to read it's this is very old and but this would be for lineal or straight measurement. I know us modern people, we like tape measures and they work very well, but if you want to, a lot of times these kind work better for things like this. There's even a couple pins here that hold it steady when it's folded up and in your pocket. So you've got straight measurement, but then you've got angular measurement. And what they used then, as now, is called a sliding T bevel. And this was used, uh, this moves, this blade moves. The more modern ones actually fold up. Well, this one does too. There it is. The modern sliding T-bevel is a copy of the antique sliding T-bevel. And what you would do with this would be, if you wanted an angle, let me take this, um, here's a table leg that I found in the um, shop here. Uh, I'll use it as an example. If I wanted to copy this angle here, and you might say, well, why would you copy that? But we won't go there right now. But if I wanted to copy an angle, I move this to that angle, I lock it, and I now have that angle. I don't know what number it is, and I don't care what number it is. You know, so if it's a 97 degree angle or whatever it is, I don't care. And neither did they. And they would take that, and then if they wanted to 
transfer that angle onto something else, say onto this board, for example. They would take that sliding T-bevel, put that there, and they would mark it. And, you know, zip, that'd be your mark. Now, the thing you've got to remember, though, is <clears throat> they didn't use pencils. Um, they didn't have pencils. Uh, what they used mostly was a sharp object, like a knife. Uh, you can actually get a more accurate marking with a knife than you can with a pencil. The only thing is with a knife, you can't erase it. But they were doing the same thing all the time and they got good at it. That's how they got an angle. But the disadvantage to a sliding t bevel is what if I bump it on something? And then it's not quite the same angle. I lost my angle. So what they had, uh, these are jigs. Uh, a jig is something that's made just for a specific purpose, and they had uh, angle jigs. This one's probably, I'm guessing, I didn't bother to find out, probably a 30 degree angle here. And so I got a 30 degree angle um, for whatever purpose. Here's a 45 degree angle. They don't move, and uh, it was specifically for that particular angle. We have a couple of compasses here, obviously, a large one. And so a lot of our modern things came from way back when. And so you had, you know, that's how you would get your get a circle or a curve. Uh, we, had, we had squares, similar to what we have now. Um, they didn't bother with, you know, most modern squares are 24 inches, a framing square, 24 by 16. They didn't have those standards yet, so they made them what they made them. So we've done angles. Uh, I want to skip back to linear measurement for a minute because I want to show you how to repeat a linear measurement. And again, we have modern tools like this. This is called a marking gauge, and this adjusts. You can move this from one end to the other. You've got a point here, and it's uh, got a scale on it. Uh, it's hard to see for the camera, but there is an inch scale on here. And so if I want, say, a half inch, I set this to half inch or whatever. And if I want to put, like, uh, say I want to put a couple holes in here, I want to put them a half inch from each corner. All right? What I can do is I can take that marking gauge and I can scribe a line here. And you see the line scribed, and then I can scribe a line here, and I'm, I've got it. I've got to see X marks a spot, and I, I've, that's how I can use a marking gauge. Now, there are more sophisticated ideas of marking gauges. This one is a double marking gauge. You've got a pin on this side, pin on this side. This adjusts. Uh, I can move this, and so if I wanted to say, put a hole, now to save time, I'm just going to say this far in on the side, and this far in on the end, I can do it. I'll mark it four inches from the end, and then two inches from the side. And I can repeat that, if I need to repeat that a hundred times, I can do it. So this one's bigger, and it's take care of two measurements at one time. Uh, if I wanted something bigger yet on the marking gauge, I can use this. And there is a uh, thumb screw missing here, but you have your point, and I don't want to move this. Right now it's set at about an inch right here. I would be able to uh, mark it an inch in. But if I wanted to mark 16 inches in, and like I said, I don't want to move it because it doesn't seem to want to move, so I don't want to force it. But this could go up to about 16 inches, and I can mark something on a larger scale. This is an interesting, I, I want you to understand the concept of what's called a jig, J-I-G. And a jig is where somebody got creative to make something happened that they needed to happen. And in this case, this is a measuring jig, 
that was here. Uh, it, at first I thought this was plywood. It's not. It's uh, curly maple, which is just darkened from age. And what they would have done is they, if they wanted to, they, uh, say, drill a hole repeatedly uh, that far from the end of something, they just put it on the end, they put it on the edge there and say there was another board here already and they would just put their drill and they would drill right where they were. So uh, jigs are something that's used over and over again for marking, for, for many, many, many things. The sky is the limit, just how creative you are is what you can do with a jig. All right, I think we've covered measurement. Let's move on. This time we're going to talk about sawing, which would be the next step. You know, before we talked about layout, then we have to cut. And uh, the first I'd like to discuss the earlier saws, the ones that would be used more in the 1700s and less in the 1800s. Uh, this is the, an example of the most uh, basic of work. Uh, this would be, actually this is almost like a small pit saw right here where you'd have one person underneath pulling down and the other person above pulling it back up. This is not really a pit saw but that's how they worked. Uh, at any rate this would be for rough sawing and a lot of it. Now uh, I'd like you to notice that the blade is smaller than what we're used to with some things. Uh, if you're used to doing woodworking or anything related to that, you know that the, a narrower blade is harder to cut straight with. And this is something we could double check, but the fact that there's less metal in the blade is partly because steel was a more valuable thing then. And right here there are some blades to bow saws. Uh, here's a really good example of a bow saw blade here. Uh, that um, you know, you've got a wider one here. The wider ones you can cut straighter with, but uh, the uh, the metal, the amount of metal, is part of it. The other part of it is, are you trying to cut straight or are you trying to cut a curve? If you're trying to cut a curve, you're fine. Here's another example, and this one, notice how narrow that blade is. And you could cut curves quite well, but on the other hand, part of it was the amount of the cost of steel, too. So anyway, we're looking at 1700s type uh, technology here mostly. Um, the way a bow saw works, obviously you, you saw with it like this, usually the teeth would be going away from you, like modern, but uh, what happens is you've got this stick and you can actually twist this around and as you twist it that pulls this tighter and as this pulls tight that pulls this tight you know, this comes in here, smaller, and that makes this space bigger and pulls it very tight. So you got a very tight saw that way. That's how they could make them. And uh, so 1700s technology bow saw. Um, then, of course, you at some point you might be into some fine work. And so we've got the same thing here, holly finer. And... Um, uh, the, this one has a rather wide blade for as small as a saw is, but uh, again, a woodworking thing is uh, the smaller the blade, the more you tend to break it. So this may have had a smaller blade in it at one time. We, we will never know. But anyway, those are bow saws. Um, let me show you a couple more bow saws. This is a fine example of a bow saw too. Somebody even used they enjoyed their own craftsmanship. Look how nice they did the curves and everything on this. Very nice saw. All right, and then the most practical saw in here. I really like this one. It's got a wider blade, which means you could cut straighter. 
again you got this is for tightening the blade and uh, you got some pretty good size to it this would be you could do some serious cutting with this uh, as we toward the shop we uh, ran into this here we have a two man tree saw is what we've got here and they haven't changed much over the last couple centuries. You can still find two-man tree saws in use a little bit today. These handles are not original, but the uh, blade is. And uh, this could be anywhere from 1700s to the 1900s, depending on um, further research. Here's another tree cutting bow saw. This would be for tree limbs or medium sized trees. Again, you got uh, a different tooth design and we'll talk about tooth design here in a minute, but uh, that's more of a tree saw type. This one's a little newer. Either that or it was fixed in there because you got some newer hardware on it. Uh, moving up into more of the 18th uh, 1800s, uh, we have saws that look more like this, and to this day you can buy a saw that looks kind of like this. Uh, here we have a crosscut saw, and um, so we found a few of these in the shop also. And um, they go back at least to the 1830s, maybe a little farther back than that. So here's another example of what we found here. This is a uh, Dissetum brand saw. You can tell the age of the saw to within about 20 years or so, roughly, by this it's called a badge. But you can see an eagle one there. And um, the Dissetum hand saws, that badge changed over time that uh, you can actually research the age of a um, this is the brand handsaw that way. All right, one more example of a tree saw, and this would be a one-man tree saw. Uh, two handles, heavy duty. All right, without going into detail on how to sharpen a saw, I will show you an interesting uh, jig that somebody had made for sharpening hand saws. You have the saw in like this, you put this whole device or jig in a uh, vise, another vise to hold it, and then you could file the teeth. Uh, the way it fit in here was uh, quite an interesting setup. They drove this board and this board in like a wedge, like two wedges beside the, on both sides of the saw. Obviously something got a little too uh, aggressive with their hammer and they drove these wedges just a little too far. All right, now I get to do something that I could not do in the other shop, and that is actually do these things because uh, I'm not allowed to use the tools, I'm just allowed to look at them. But here I have my own tools, so I can use them. And let me show you, first of all, I'm gonna show you, whenever you're cutting across a board, that's called cross cutting, and whenever you're cutting with the grain of the board, that's called ripping. And the saws are different. I didn't show you the teeth on those saws in there, but you would have had the same. You would have cross cut saws, you would have rip saws. Um, but first, before I actually cut, I'll go ahead and scribe this. I'll take my uh, square, and notice I do not have a pencil. I have a scribe, and um, it would be used like this. All right, you also notice, okay, we got this wonderful woodworking uh, bench here. Uh, this is called a front vise, and this one over here is called a tail vise. And I'll show you the tail vise later, but front vise, you also notice that woodworking uh, vices have a wooden, usually, if they're original, they have a wooden handle. There's a reason for that. If that handle is out this way when you're sawing and you accidentally, when you go through the board, hit the handle, if it's a wooden handle, you just nick the handle a little bit and go on and say, oh, darn, I nicked the handle a little bit. If it's a metal handle, 
you have no appreciation until you actually sharpen the handsaw how much time and effort it takes to sharpen a saw and how quickly you can mess it up. So they uh, have a wooden handle for a reason. And anyway, a lot of people don't understand it. Uh, they pick up a saw that hasn't been sharpened for 40 years, and then they wonder, oh my, how could they ever cut anything with these? But they, they work pretty well. Uh, this is one of my most interesting tools. This is my own here. Uh, it has my great, great grandfather's name on it. And uh, I'm thinking that, uh, well, this isn't the oldest saw I'm going to use today, but this one's, uh, anyway, it's been in the family for a long time. <laughs> Said, if you have a sharp saw, that's pretty good. All right, now I'd like to show you how a rip saw works. I'll also show you how a tail vise works. Uh, these type of woodworking benches have holes in the uh, bench, and these were you have these wedges that you can put in. And um, if I had a if I had an eight foot long board, I can come all the way up here and I can put a wedge in here and put a board, you know, however long it is. In this case, I'm not that long. I put the board in like this, tighten it up like this, and that's how my tail vise works. This is a rip saw for cutting with the grain. And you can tell by the teeth are filed straight across rather than filing on an angle is how you can tell a rip saw from a cross cut saw. You can also tell because the rip saw teeth are usually a little bigger, but that you can't always go by that. All right, I don't have a line here, I'm just cutting. And uh, so what you do is you draw back on it, so a little bit. they do a pretty good job. There was a uh, tendency of this board, sometimes you get a board where the wood grain, when you cut, the wood tends to close in on it. And I think that might have been a little true here. Also, there's a characteristic that you can, the person sharpening the saw, in this case was me, can, um, you can put more, um, what's called set in the teeth. If you have a lot of set, it means the teeth, you got one that goes this way, one goes that way, one this way, one that way. Uh, the less set there is, the more the saw will catch in the wood as that one, as this one did here. Uh, the more set you have, the less it'll catch in the wood, but the rougher the cut. So you have to have a trade-off. Do you want a rough cut and the saw not catch? or do you want a finer cut and the saw catches a little, so something to think about. We didn't find any of these in this cabinet shop. There probably were some of these. This is called a back saw. And the reason it's called a back saw, you got the heavy back. Uh, they made them in cross cut or rip, although a lot of cabinet makers just used a cross cut because you can rip with a cross cut saw, it's just not as fast. And these aren't for fast cutting, these are for fine cutting, like making dovetails and stuff like that. They even have a smaller one that's called a dovetail saw, but they, this is your basic back saw. Uh, if you ever do find a dovetail saw, uh, let me know, I'd like to have one. <laughs> but uh, the handle is angled up more so that you're not having to uh, get yourself down as low. Uh, if I go very far, this will catch. 
on the wood because it doesn't, doesn't have much set. It has a little bit of set, not much. Anyway, this would be used for cutting uh, the fine cuts, like the dovetails, things like that. Hello again. Uh, today I'd like to show you about uh, planes. There are two main varieties of planes. Uh, ones that could be called molding planes, we'll deal with that separately. And in the flat planes, which are for uh, getting things either flat or getting a wood joint where you've got two boards coming together nicely. Uh, and uh, these are probably a European design plane. This one, this one, the uh, front handle is actually broken. But uh, at any rate, you've got the, what I think is European. Then you've got your other basic flat planes. I tried to do a fair sampling of each here. This is sometimes called a coffin plane because you can see the shape of it. But this would be like a block plane. And you think, oh, gee, this is a lot more convenient to use than this. And so why the difference? Uh, if you use this, what will happen with a board is, here, I'll just get a long board here. And say, if I was to turn this into, a, say, a tabletop, and this was a board in a tabletop, if I used this plane to do this edge, it would do this, and it would, you wouldn't be able to get it straight enough. So, the longer the plane is, the more accurate you can be. The uh, disadvantage to longer is uh, they're more heavy and more difficult to use. I've got two here that are the same size, and I purposely did that because, A, this is the size that they would have used most of the time. 90% of the time you're using a plane this big. And what really works well is to set one light for just a light cut and have another one set for a heavier cut. So that's why I picked two of the same size because they would probably have used two of the same size depending on how light cut, heavy cut. Then you get into trying to get a straight edge. And this, you could actually, if you wanted to build a, say, a 12-foot banquet table, this would work just fine. Although, some people would prefer longer. There's longer, and then longer yet, right here. Now, as I get into this, you're obviously not noticing, but the weight becomes a more of a factor, especially if you're going to run this a couple hundred times over a board. Uh, the longest ones, and old economy, there's a lot of planes here. And I'm just showing you a sampling, but there's probably uh, 10 this size here. And this is a hand plane. It um, probably had a handle back here, and we don't have it anymore. And it probably had a handle here, and we don't have it anymore. If you wanted something extremely straight, this would be the kind of thing you'd want to use. This was probably not run by one person. Uh, this would be two people. And what they would do is one person, remember these two? One person would take the one that's set course, they would run it until uh, they get the board where they almost wanted it, and maybe pick up another one, do a finer job, and then they'd get their friend or friends to push and pull a plane like this to get one Ideally, just one swath and you'd get maybe two or three or ten, depending on how good you are. But you'd get the board extra uh, smooth and straight. You have all these holes in the tape. And now here's an oddity. This fence doesn't have a hole here. Now I have a feeling it's just because they thought there would be too much stress. So the board actually, on this one, uh, if you were this length here and shorter, you could put it in and you'd have the board perfectly straight in the bench. But here, you're back on that angle just because of the uh, not wanting to break the vise. If you put this in here like this, like this, and then you would take your planes 
And at some point, you would end up using a big plane, get it uh, nice and straight. So this is a tail vise. If you're working with something shorter, you would be working with a vise like this. This is the forerunner of the front vise that we're used to in shops today. This is called a knee vise. And what it would work, here I'll show you a quick easy thing first. So I want to tighten the board up, no problem. The thing is, as you turn it out, this angle becomes more and more. So this angle, if this board was, like you want to put it in this way, for example, you'd have it on such an angle that it might want to pop out. So, the way the knee vice works, this pulls out here at the bottom, and you put a pin in here, and that would hold this so that when you tighten it, here, let me just bring this out to show you. Uh, I don't have a pin handy, but if I wanted to put that board in that way, i put a pin in here, tighten this up, and it would work just as well as a modern vise. The only thing is you have to mess with this pin, which is no big deal because you're usually working with the same board for a while, and so that's fairly easy. So you've got your knee vise. Uh, you've also got some other ways of holding wood, especially with hand tools, holding things is actually a pretty big deal. And they also use what's called a hold down. This was made right here in Old Economy uh, recently. This is not an antique. This is like maybe two years old. And the way it would work, this is called a hold fast. You put it in the, one of these holes like this. You take a mallet and you slide it. And it's very tight. And so you can hold boards down and do whatever you wanted to. Um, here's a couple more examples of uh, old economies mallets that were used. Um, to be honest with you, this one's mine because I'm allowed to beat on my own stuff. And uh, then to get that hold fast loose, what you would do, just hit it from the bottom, they would come loose and they work quite well. All right, now here we have samples of different types of molding planes, and I wanted to show them to you. And um, also I'm gonna show you a little bit about uh, the way things are often built too at the same time. So a little bit of both. Uh, right here we have a plane that's made to do a uh, tongue, like a tongue and groove. Um, this would make the groove right here. Uh, the, if you had a plane that was built for just some use, they'd be all wood. And then occasionally, when they really were going to use it a lot, the deluxe versions had metal. There was an in-between, too, that they used rosewood in uh, places here. That Rosewood is extremely uh, strong, and so they'd sometimes do that. Uh, this almost lends itself to explain, like, like if you ever wondered about a frame and panel door. The way they were made, uh, most people nowadays look at frame and panel doors as, uh, oh, look at the pretty door. But that's not why they did that. They did it because they were, would stay straight and they would last longer. If I made a door this wide right here, uh, out of a solid board, which would be a lot less work, that board could expand and contract up to a fourth of an inch just from humidity. And so this is made to expand and contract less right here. And also it's made to uh, stay straighter because you have the boards on the end that keep it straight. Now, we were talking about planes, okay? Now the way this is built, okay, obviously you got some pins in here, and the pins would be drilled with something similar to this. I probably have the wrong diameter, but close. And you would drill the holes here. That would actually be last in the process. Well, um, okay, with a frame panel door, here you have a groove, and I don't guarantee that I'm using the right plane here to show you, but here we would have a plane to make a groove. And then um, 
you would have a tongue, what I call the end here. This is a, a tongue cut. Now that's a bad example. But anyway, you could have a tongue plane to make a, a tongue and groove joint. Um, this flat part here, uh, you would have a plane that would work like this one. And this is uh, commonly called a rabbit plane. And now this isn't the right one. This, this did not make this. Uh, this is not quite wide enough, but you would hold it on an angle and you would do your, uh, your panel, except for the wider one of these. All these planes here at the end are examples of tongue and groove. Uh, this is this one being for a tongue, this one being for a groove, and they would be like in matched sets. Uh, you have an interesting plane here that's, uh, this would do a tongue right here except it could be used by two people if they wanted to. Uh, with the extra handles, it's pretty amazing the way they uh, built that one. Uh, if you wanted to put a groove in farther, you had what's called a plow plane. And these are extra cool. These, these are wooden threads. These move in and out. You, can, you have what you call a fence right here, and that would move that, so if you wanted a groove farther into the board, you could do that. And they also had molding planes that did that, but here's two examples of a, what's called a plow plane, is the correct name for that. And yes, they do work. Now, we'll start getting into molding planes. And like this one here, this molding plane just does not, uh, would be an inside curve. You'd say, well, what's that? That's not really enough. I wouldn't want to make the guy mad that could actually use this plane. This thing is awesome. But I think it would be very hard to adjust and very hard to use. You can see the blade is probably about three and a half inches across. And there would, you would get a molding type. I think this sample matches up that um, that is the shape that this plane would be capable of doing. Now the problem is, two problems. One, adjusting planes like these was very, very difficult. You're talking tolerances of a couple thousandths of an inch and you're adjusting it with a hammer. And um, this would be very hard to use. So what they did is they combined shapes. Like this one here was a, would do you an inside curve. Here's another inside curve that's smaller. Um, this one has a combination of shapes to it, outside and inside. But that's about as complicated as they usually tried to get because they would combine that with another plane to get the shape that you wanted if you wanted a larger shape. These planes here were probably used most likely in barrel making. Uh, this is called a compass plane. You notice how its uh, bottom is not flat and that's no accident. And it would be used to go around the edge, the curved edge. And uh, here's another example of the same thing. This one cuts a flat this is a flat bottomed plane, but it's, it's a compass flat bottomed plane. So this would do a curve, um, flat bottomed plane, and here's a, this would cut a groove on a curve. The old molded planes were kind of like router bits. And right now we're showing you many samples of molding planes. And if you look at the bottoms of them, you can see all the different shapes that they cut. And so you, the, a good cabinet maker who was, who was well equipped might have 80 hand planes and you've got a whole variety here. Remember you can combine those shapes and you can make all kinds of shapes with those. All right, I wanted to tell you about drilling holes and uh, the starting with the smallest and working our way up, the, uh, these things here are called gimlets. And a gimlet, well, I'll go to the biggest one here, uh, they're incremental just like a set of drill bits.
way it's, it's got a spoon shape to it, all right, and I'll show you a larger spoon bit later, but this would be used like this. You put it to the wood. I don't want to mess up the lathe, but you just turn it like that, and it, they drill remarkably quickly. I didn't want you to get gimlets confused with carving chisels or uh, a lathe gouge. This, was, this would be a carving chisel, the way you would do it, you would put your hand on it like this, and you could control it like this, and you would uh, do hand carving with it. Or, if you want a really intricate lathe cut, you might use it too. So, a gouge carving chisel looks a lot like a gimlet, and, but that's the difference. And not to mention a screwdriver. We have some machine screws, old example of screwdriver. And here's an example of an older screw. Alright, as we work our way up to larger hole sizes, we have uh, what's called a hand brace. And that's what this is. This would be early 1800s. Uh, the early 1800s, you'd have a bit like this. It's called a spoon bit. And you would have the older type hand brace. Nothing moves here. So this would be slipping in your hand. This would be slipping in your hand and it would actually wear your hand out. So they got a little better and uh, this would be late 1800s. This handle pivots and this pivots and the same thing. Uh, late 1800s you had bits like this that uh, were capable of uh, fitting in here. Next we have augers and uh, what it really deals with is leverage. You have more of a handle the bigger the hole, obviously, the more strength it takes to drill it. So this is a hand auger. This one's machine made. This is, you can tell here, this is a, uh, for cutting tapered holes for pins. And it's obviously handmade. And I have an extra cool hand auger type device here. This is for tapers. And now, I'll give you a really good example of what this would be for. First of all, I want you to note that somebody, years past, put a mark on it there as a depth gauge. Now, I don't know how far back that depth gauge was used, but what they would have done on a post and beam building like this, I'm looking right up here now, see that where there's pins here and here? And what they would do, they would cut them, they would cut four mortises in this beam. And they would fit these small pieces in, but they did this on the ground. They did this laying flat on the ground, probably, not guaranteeing anything. But then they would take a this a auger like this. This one is intriguing because it's fairly likely could have done this. It's the right diameter. And you would drill a tapered hole, and on these wood lathes, you, you wonder what they did with the wood lathes so much. Of course, they made, of course they made furniture, but also they made pins that were tapered. And those tapered pins, they would drive them in, and then I was thinking they'd break, they'd cut them off, but in, in this case, it looks more like they broke them off. But anyway, this is hand forged, and it's for cutting tapered holes, and it would not surprise me at all if this tool did that. We'll never know. I'd like to show you a little bit about chisels. And here we have a typical large wood chisel. Uh, normally this one would be a, a wood chisel. This is a lathe gouge, which is a different type of chisel. So you've got that difference. You've got a gouge, you've got a straight chisel. This is normally used on a lathe. This is usually used by hand. The other difference I wanted to show you is a quality difference. Now on a lathe gouge, this wouldn't matter so much, but this is what's called a tang chisel. And it's the cheaper way of making things where the blacksmith would just forge basically a point on here and then drive it into the wood. And that's called a tang-type chisel, the way it's put together. 
A better way of putting it together is called a socket chisel, and this one's already loose, so I can pull it out of here. You've got a hole in it right here that this is turned on the lathe and goes in here, and when it fits right, the more you hit it, the tighter it gets. And the tang chisel will tend to split the handle, but a socket chisel will compress the handle and last a lot longer. Now sharpening, right now this is about as dull as a butter knife. We have a wonderful example of a uh, grindstone here. This would be a two-man operation. You'd have one person turn it and the other one would grind and you'd hold it like this and it would spin this way. There's no tool wrist on this, which rather makes sense, really, because it's for rough sharpening. And that's how you would do your rough sharpening. Sharpening, we showed you the first step, and that other tool, the other grinder, didn't even have a tool rest on it. This one does, and now it's belt drive. You have a very old belt, which I will not turn because I am pretty sure I would break it. There's a treadle down here that functions pretty much like a treadle sewing machine. And at one time, this wheel was probably larger in diameter. As we know, grinding wheels tend to get smaller with use. This would be for the fine, finer grinding. You'd have a tool rest here. When that wheel was bigger, you'd be holding the chisel like this. And as the uh, wheel wears down, you'd be holding the chisel like this, working the treadle, getting it a finer cut. So this is a fine example of a fine cutting sharpening machine. Now we're ready for a hand sharpening stone. This one was found here on site. And sharpening stones, you it's actually possible to skip the first two steps that I showed you, the rough sharpening stone and the fine sharpening, and just use a sharpening stone. They range in anywhere from 600 grit to probably 10,000 grit. The higher the number, the finer, the smoother the cut, and you need to work down to those real smooth cuts to get it really, really sharp. This is a very fine cut. They probably didn't have a number on these, like I just said, 10,000 grit or whatever. I'm guessing this to be about an 8,000, but I, they probably didn't use numbers. They, these were often called whetstones also. And the reason they call them whetstones is if you used them dry, you would clog the stone. So generally they'd use either oil or you could use water. And with a little bit of oil on there, you run this around and get it sharp and then just one or two swipes to get the back cleaned off. This would normally conclude what I'd say about wood chisels, but I find myself compelled to tell you the, that a wood chisel is the most dangerous hand tool in a hand tool shop. And the most common mistake would be that somebody thinks they can hold the piece of wood that they're going to work with. They hold the wood with their one hand, try to push with the chisel with the other. And these are supposed to be razor sharp. And that's how people get hurt. The way you hold a chisel, always, put your, if you're right-handed, your left hand on top of the chisel, right hand back here. You can push, you can control it. And notice the bevel is down. The reason for that is I can control the depth, so that's no mistake the way I have a bevel. Just wanted to show a few things that we've just sort of run across here that we missed earlier. This is a small carving gouge. Could be used on the lathe, could be used for carving, we'll never know. This is probably a fret saw. Now, one type of saw that is not here that I find amazing that it's not here is a back saw. 
And uh, this is the only example of a back saw that we found. And this is probably for fret making on a musical instrument. Might have been used in clock making, but the blade only st sticks out about an eighth of an inch. But anyway, that is the only example of a back saw that we found. And I, when I say back saw, I use the term rather loosely. Going in the other, to the other extreme, this is the biggest plane we found for finished work. This plane did this shape. And you can see a cross section of this shape right here. And it, uh, the bottom of it is shaped like that. Now the thing that we're not doing here is trying to use it. I'm actually pretty glad of that. As mentioned before, they'd often do planing in small segments. Here's a good example. This is really three boards here. You've got one board with one shape, another board with another shape, and another with another shape to make a type of molding that looked bigger. And what they normally do would be to do in small segments. This one is so odd because it's such a big thing all at once. This would be horrible to adjust. And you'd have to have it within probably one or two thousandths of an inch at the most to be able to push it and get it to work right. So this would be very hard to use. But anyway, that was an interesting example. Now moving right on to clamping, we've got some examples of clamps here. Here's a wooden C-clamp, and here's a metal version of the same thing. This is hand wrought, and uh, so you see an example of a hand wrought C-clamp. We also have what's called a screw clamp, and this has wooden threads, and I don't have, what they used for cutting wooden threads was a tap for cutting internal wooden threads, and what's called a die for cutting external wooden threads. I couldn't find a die anywhere, but I did find a tap. You can match the up here but it doesn't match perfectly so this tool did not make this but that's uh, for the internal threads. Here's an interesting jig that we found. Remember a jig is something that is used for just about anything. In this case it's probably making small picture frames to clamp them or maybe a clock part. Again we'll never know. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, if you wanted, if you needed something big, excuse me, we have what's called a bar clamp, and we have bar clamps, modern bar clamps. Many people have used the ones that are based on a pipe. This, this would uh, move here. You could adjust it to whatever rough adjustment here. <clears throat> Again, you have wooden threads which you would tighten up the, uh, so that you didn't mark up the wood if you were clamping into that. What you do is you put a piece of scrap wood in between the, you know, to protect the good piece. Here we have a joiner plane, and this could have been used in a cabinet shop. More likely it was used in the coopering shop, <clears throat> but we'll never know. The blade is missing. We have the what held the blade in, that's what this is. And the way it would work would be run the board over it, just like you would an electric joiner, like this. And uh, it seems less safe than a regular plane, but I'm sure if people used it all the time, they got pretty used to it. What we have here are two fine examples of shaving benches. This one's authentic to old economy, and it's a little rickety, and so I don't want to mess with it very much. This one here was donated, and I'm allowed to use it to show you how it works. The way a shaving bench works is you've got a lever here that you push with your foot. And so what you can do is you take a board, and you put it in here, and 
you can, it holds it just like a vise. And the nice thing about this vise is I can release it and do it, I can do it a thousand times and it's pretty easy. What I would do with that would be, I would use what's called a draw knife. And by the way, this is uh, also the way they finished off making shingles. But uh, you use the draw knife, pull, you would draw it forward. This is supposed to be razor sharp. And you pull it towards you like this. They also had a, what's what called a spoke shave, which was like this. And I'd pull it, now you guess you might never guess what they used this for. What would you use a spoke shave for? Hmm. Maybe making spokes. Here we have one of the Harmonist's wood lathes. And this is an awesome machine. I mean, look at it. You, you gotta be King Kong to they made a bench to stand on, which I'm now standing on because this machine is so tall. And the reason it's so tall is you have this wheel here. The idea is a person would work this treadle, which would make this spin. And basically, you've got what you have on a modern leg. You have the head stock. You have the tail stock. You have, uh, in this case, it's a four-jaw chuck, which isn't quite all there, but almost. You have a four-jaw chuck right here. This is called the tool rest right here. And <clears throat> then you would have your lathe tools. For most of the time, taking off a lot of wood, you'd use what's called a gouge. And a gouge is shaped like this with the spoon, and it works better than a flat chisel. And now this, normally this uh, tool rest would be closer to the wood than what I am. It would be more like an eighth of an inch in length. And I'd work the blade like this. I put the handle here, put it up against myself, and I've got lots and lots of leverage. And I'd be turning this. And uh, by the way, this is a multiple speed lathe too. And you've got a smaller place for the belt to be here that would make it uh, go faster. So this is the slower one, that's the faster one. You have what's called a skew, which is the angle of it is skewed off to the side. They're more for if you're trying to get something straight. Normally like this straight part here, you would use a gouge first, get most of that off, and then straighten it out with a skew. All right, let's say we wanted to put a hole in a board, all right? We would use one of the augers, we would drill a hole. Let's say we want to go one step further and make a square hole. What you would do to make a square hole would be, you'd, you'd mark it out first, then you'd drill a round hole just like this, then you'd use a chisel, this one is for some very robust work. You see the thickness of the metal here. And to uh, chisel out that circular hole into a square hole or a mortise, which would be a, just the same except with a, it would be bottomed. They would often or mostly use mallet, a wooden mallet, instead of a metal hammer because if you have a wooden chisel, the wooden mallet will do less damage to your chisel and the chisel will last longer. So that's how they would do that. Of course this would be an advice I should add. This is called a, a cornering chisel. You see how we do a nice corner. This is one step up from that and again you'd have to pound on this and that would get your square corners onto that round hole. So that's a second way to do it. This tool is deluxe. This is for making square holes. This is called a mortising machine. And any cabinet maker of the time would be absolutely drooling at a machine like this. The way it works is you've got a treadle down here and you push on the treadle and the cutter, you have a chisel in here 
And this all adjusts. This table adjusts up and down. This fence adjusts out and back. Now here's another feature. This is almost like a bow and arrow here. You got wood that actually bends. I can move it a little. I'm afraid to move it at its full travel, but you can see how it works. You can see this moving right here. And you put the board in here, you chalk down on this, and it would cut out square holes way faster than the other two. So I'm showing you a regular chisel, a quartering chisel, and a deluxe mortising tool. Alright, here we are looking at a boring machine. Now I was unable, we were unable to find a brand name on it, but I'm guessing that it's made by Miller's Falls Corporation. They, uh, these were invented in the 1860s by Miller's Falls. It's the heaviest drilling machine in here. Uh, the way it would work, you would put your foot in here, and this would tighten up, and if you were drilling like a large hole, like what I, an example here, in a 6x6 six six or an 8x8 eight eight board or whatever, anything big, uh, this, first of all, the, the angle adjusts, I turned it so I could see it be better, but I could set this to a 90 degree angle and get it dialed in perfectly. And then you've got lots and lots of leverage and lots and lots of strength there. And you can turn this this way. There's a, I'm going to turn it a little so you can see better. This is, whenever you have a gear that's laid out in a straight line like that, that's called a rack. And this rack would engage with this gear here and this gear once engaged with that rack, you would advance it somewhat. So you would push it over, you'd advance it, and then you'd crank until it got easier, push that over, crank again, and you could put a whole good sized hole in a piece of wood rather quickly. The boards that they use was amazing. This board that I'm standing on, this is not plywood. This is a board. And that's probably 24, 25 inches wide. I don't think you'll find any boards that wide that you can buy today. Also, up along the ceiling, there's some thicker examples of, uh, they had really good wood to choose from then. Hardwood trees and very good examples of wood available. As we conclude this tour of the Old Economies cabinet shop, I want to tell you that nobody has enjoyed this more than me. All these toys, I mean tools to look at and, and experiment with, it's been great. The way that people did this, the skill that was involved to be able to think, produce better furniture then than we do now, and to think they did it with this basic stuff that we've looked at, it's wonderful. And quite an honor to be able to take a look at all this stuff and enjoy it. Hope you've enjoyed this as much as me.